uh, Raya is a um, uh, research, uh, senior research scientist and direct, director of robotics at DeepMind. Uh, she has worked on deep learning and robotics problems for over 10 years. Um, her thesis on Vision for Mobile Robots won the best dissertation award from New York University and was followed by a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute. Her research interests include a number of fundamental challenges in AGI, including continual and transfer learning, deep reinforcement learning, and neural models of uh, navigation. Today, she will be talking about continual learning in complex environment. Thank you for being here, and it's all to you, Raya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina, for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure uh, collaborating with you as well. Um, so uh, yes, uh, thanks for having me at the at, at the summer school um, in winter in London. Not quite as planned, um, but hopefully with the success from this year from these great set of organizers, then it will go on in future years, um, and there will be in in person meetings. Um, so I'm going to talk today about continual learning. Uh, this, uh, although I'm the director of robotics at DeepMind, um, I believe that continual learning is uh, one of the most important research areas for modern machine learning and is very important for a lot of areas, robotics included. So let's jump into it. First, I'll start by uh, the statement of that the world is non-stationary. Um, which uh, should be obvious to anybody if they look out the window, but let me say a little bit more about what I, um, why I think that this is an important um, statement to make. So when we build and deploy machine learning algorithms, um, we uh, practitioners, machine learning researchers, assume that, the, that our problem domain is fixed and somehow that uh, all of the variability that matters is going to be captured in a static data set or a learning environment. But th this, this isn't true in a lot of domains. So for example, health, um, there can be, uh, this is a uh, non-stationary um, problem domain where an individual might change, a patient might change over time, will change over time. Um, a disease or the treatments for that disease uh, will change over time um, and, 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 and many other factors at a population level, for instance, epidemiologically things will, things will change over time and any fixed solution um, is not going to be adaptable enough to cover that change to be, to be ideal. Um, we can look at robotics. Uh, in, in robotics, again, there can be changes at different levels. Uh, the environment outside might change. So I used to work on field robots, robots trying to navigate through the forest. Um, and of course, that would change with the time of day, the weather, or the season of the year, um, what the input to that robot is. And the robot itself would change as well. Again, highly non-stationary environments, any fixed approach, static approach that assumes that is going to uh, not be optimal. Um, even in an area where, uh, like language, where we assume that for the most part, languages are fixed, um, they're not changing too much. We can train big language models and then they, that'll be the end of it. That's not true. So uh, of the most, of the 10,000 most often used words in English, 10% of them change every year. So that's a huge amount of change. Um, and language models it can't adapt to that. If you look at language models over time, um, if they're trained on one set of data and then evaluated um, years afterwards, then there will be a steady degre degradation of the performance because of that change in the vocabulary, the usage, and the meaning of, of the words. Um, and so this is a problem. This is a problem for deep learning because deep learning has been shown to work really well. Deep learning is a really good match for big data. Um, deep learning is a set of methods that works, um, that, that is very powerful because it can scale easily to fit large data sets. Um, large scale compute works very well with large uh, deep neural networks. Um, and, and, and optimization works extremely well to train on uh, big data. Um, 
However, that optimization is gradient based. It assumes that the data set is homogenous, balanced, shuffled, um, properly uh, you know, curated, and most importantly, randomly sampled during training. Um, usually train on large mini batches of data that are sampled from the data set, as I'm sure you all know. Um, this means that we are making this assumption that the data is not going to change. Um, it also, I'll make the argument a little bit later in my talk, it also means that um, these models are actually quite inefficient. No matter how fast and powerful they are, um, there is a core inefficiency of this process of, of, of how they learn. Um, and in terms of non-stationary envi environments, there are big problems. These large models are going to suffer from catastrophic forgetting, interference, and other failure modes. Um, if, the, if they're trained in over sequential data. Um, I will point out from the biological perspective that we don't learn very well from randomly sampled data. Um, if I asked my son um, to learn high school biology by sampling pages from his textbook at random, it wouldn't work well. He needs to learn um, not even necessarily in a curriculum, but with some context, a chapter at a time, a topic at a time, with some organized uh, fl continuous flow to, uh, to the learning process. Um, you know, imagine if I asked him to learn all of his subjects in mini batches where each batch contained a page from each of his textbooks. This is ridiculous. And yet this is how we would train a deep neural network that we somehow still claim is biologically motivated, is biologically inspired. Um, there's a real disconnect here um, that, 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 that I think we tend to overlook. We learn in a, a non-stationary world and we learn in a non-stationary way. Models that we work with, however, half get less and less efficient um, the more you break that underlying assumption of, uh, of, of uniform sampling. Um, what could be gained if we enabled deep learning to learn sequentially? I think that there's a few wins here. Um, so first of all, what I pointed out to with applications, applications that continually adapt to track a changing problem and yet still remain stable and still can use some of those same powerful large methods, large models, um, those could specialize to a domain really well. Um, uh, so think about epidemiological models, think about language specialization. This would be enabled. Um, think about having robots or uh, um, assistance, virtual assistance, or other types of, um, of, of AIs that can add skills over time and become more capable over time. So think about a robot that could learn across a curriculum of new information, new challenges, and become more capable. Um, as long as we're talking about robots and um, AI applications, let's go all the way to human level intelligence. Um, the argument has been, has been made, and I support it, that continual learning is a requisite to get to human level intelligence. Um, we're never going to be able to accumulate a large enough data set to get us to AGI. <laughs> there always has to be a bigger data set, a bigger data set, a bigger data set. Um, instead, we have to solve continual learning if we want to get to AGI. Um, and coming back to what we're doing right now, I think that we could even have dramatically more efficient deep learning methods in stationary settings. All right, so let me uh, do some definitions here. Important to know what we're talking about, and I don't want to assume that everybody um, has thought about uh, continual learning, which is also, by the way, called lifelong learning, uh, continuum learning, um, even online learning. Um, uh, I think there's another one, but I've forgotten it. Anyway, let me let me give you my. Uh, I don't really care what it's what it's called. I think that we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about a uh, a problem setting, and we're talking about a set of characteristics that a solution would have for the continual learning uh, solutions. So, when we talk about continual learning problems, we talk about a non-stationary learning environment 
that is comprised of a set of tasks that need to be completed, need to be learned sequentially. Um, and then there's lots of variations on that. Um, and those can vary with the type of domain that you're in or just the type of benchmark that people have put together. But we can look at either smooth or discrete task transitions. So a smooth task transition might be going from um, winter to spring to summer. Um, a discrete task transition might be me going for a run, then a bike ride, then getting in my car and driving. Um, task length and repetition, this can change. We can talk about uh, revisiting tasks, cycling through them, or simply viewing each task once and learning to convergence before moving on to, to the next in a, in a sequence. Um, task type. I'm using the word task, which is often associated with reinforcement learning, but what I'm, it could be, uh, it could be an unsupervised problem um, like clustering, could be a supervised problem like classification, or it could be a reinforcement learning task, um, or maybe nothing that you could call a task at all. Um, so, and I'll, I'll point out that although I mentioned curriculum learning, this is different than what we think about uh, in research as cur curriculum learning, in which the sequence of tasks is controlled by uh, the, the decisions of the learner or from a beneficent teacher that gives a sort of ideal sequence of, um, of tasks to learn that increase in complexity. Um, solutions. Things get a little bit muddier when we start to look at the characteristics of continual learning solutions. Um, this is because there's a lot of different desiderata, things we might like to see in a solution, and they're often contradictory or at least competing. Um, so first of all, what are the sort of, what are, what are the constraints we're putting on solutions? Well, we want to have minimum access to previous tasks. So the model can't have just infinite storage to store all previous experience, and it can't interact with previously seen tasks because that sort of breaks the, breaks the whole idea of non-stationary learning. Um, secondly, a minimal increase in model capacity and computation. So the approach has to be scalable. It can't just keep on adding parameters forever. Um, it need, there needs to be some notion that it's going to scale, that it's going to not uh, rely on infinite capacity or infinite memory. Um, fast adaptation and recovery. So um, a key piece of this, and you'll notice that this overlaps with meta-learning and what's often uh, said to be the, the, the goal there, the model should be capable of fast adaptation um, and of fast recovery when presented with, with, with past tasks. So there's a notion of efficiency here of time and perhaps increasing in efficiency as we, um, as we continue to see tasks. Um, fourth, minimizing catastrophic forgetting and interference. Um, so training on new tasks should not significantly reduce performance on previously learned tasks. A lot of research that I see in this field only focuses on this, but really there are a lot more constraints here that we should think about. It's not just, it's not just catastrophic forgetting. Um, we can see catastrophic forgetting um, in this little illustration here, this figure where we see that, um, so over time, we learn task one, then task two, then, then task three. At each time point, I'm going to evaluate, however, my performance on all three tasks. So after learning task one, I have a high performance on task one, flat performance on two and three. When I learn task two, I learn that to full performance, but I have forgotten my performance on task one has fallen off a cliff. And when I learn task three, then the performance continues to degrade on earlier tasks. Fifth desiderata is maintaining plasticity. Um, so this means that the model needs to be keep needs to be able to keep learning new things. Um, and we see failures in this, um, for instance, because perhaps we learn task one, but we use a lot of regularization or we use up the capacity of our model. And when we try to learn task two, maybe we didn't forget task one because of regularization, but we are unable to learn task two and so on. Um, so this illustrates that plasticity has fallen off um, or we can call this learning intransigence. 
um, which I like because you can also apply this that term to five-year-olds who don't want to learn over Zoom. All right, um, the sixth characteristic for a continual learning solution um, is one of the most important ones. This is to maximize forward and backwards transfer. So when we think about our, our uh, distribution of tasks, our sequence of tasks, there are always going to be some relationships there. Um, a sequence of Atari games where one can transfer the notion of a paddle and a ball between breakout and pong. Um, or uh, shooting the space creatures um, with bullets in, in various other games. There are things that can be transferred. When those things can be transferred, um, then we want to see that. So in this illustration, we see that over time, um, when I learn task two, having learned task one, I actually do better than if I just learned it on its own. And I do better on task three because I am using information from task one and task two. And this might show up as a, a faster learning or higher performance. Uh, we can measure that, measure that in both ways. And backwards transfer is interesting. This is saying that um, after I have trained on say task two, then I actually improve my performance on task one. After I've trained on task three, I improve my performance a little bit on previous tasks because I'm uh, changing the shared parameters there in a way that is beneficial. All right, so we've got six desiderata, but if you look at these, then you realize that they don't actually all quite fall in together nicely. So um, if we want to maintain perfect recall, so absolutely maintain our previous performance, um, in a fixed capacity model, that is impossible given an arbitrarily long sequence of tasks. You have to somehow manage some fall off in performance on previously learned tasks or some increase in capacity um, if you want to actually have this uh, work for um, an indeterminately long sequence. Um, this motivates fast, fast recovery. Maybe we want to uh, forget some of our previous performance if we can guarantee that when we return to that task, we only take a little bit of experience to get back up to speed. I might sort of forget how to play piano, but when I get back in front of the piano and I play around for an hour, maybe it comes back to me and I get back to my previous performance without needing to study for years. Um, forward and backwards transfer contrasts with the ability to uh, to perfectly recall previous tasks, um, similar to the first point. So any solution is going to need to compete, uh, balance some competing needs. And uh, it's hard to define what that optimal trade-off is. Um, I, I hope that uh, as this field of continual learning continues to grow and develop, uh, which it has been over the last several years, I, I hope that we don't stay with problems such as a sequence of permuted MNIST digits, um, but instead really start to grapple with real world problem domains um, and use those to define what that, how that trade-off should look, for instance. Um, all right, so next part of the talk is on tug of war learning dynamics. Um, thanks to Razvan for the gift. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what, 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 what does this mean? So let's get down to sort of the heart of what happens when we train a, um, when we train a deep learning model or when we train everything using gradient-based optimization. Um, and some of this is going to be well known to probably everybody in this call but bear with me because the point I'm going to make, I think is important. Um, so I would assert that continual learning is a challenge for deep learning models um, and not for other models, for instance, uh, graphical models because of gradient-based optimization. Um, so gradient-based learning, it's effective, it's cheap, works well with our compute, works well with backprop. It's the deregur method for training neural networks for decades now. Um, but what's actually happening there? So um, each training sample produces a gradient 
for each parameter in the network. And that gradient is a vote or a pull to make the parameter bigger or smaller, move it up or down. Um, so in a mini batch, um, a gradient is produced by each sample in parallel. And those are summed together to decide how that one parameter is actually going to change. Um, but note that the parameter can't somehow be an average of all of these different things. In the end, the parameter is moving in one direction, right? So this is a tug of war. It's a tug of war that happens between many different samples from across my data set. And each of those tug of wars happens over each parameter and decides how it's going to move. And this tug of war is what results in learning convergence in a stable learning process. So why is this important? Well, what it means is that we need to see all of the data. The data needs to be IID, in other words, independent and identically distributed for parameters to reach an equilibrium and for the learning process to converge. So if they're not IID, if the data is sampled one part of it over here, and then we switch and sample this part of it over here, what happens? Well, catastrophic forgetting happens because now you've got unopposed gradients from task two, and that causes those parameters to get pulled right over in our tug of war and for all the parameters to shift very rapidly towards a new solution. So we can see that depicted here in our two parameter case um, or our two dimension case with parameters um, where we go from convergence on a task one solution to then learning on a task to task two. And we see a rapid change in the parameters away from the task one solution. That's catastrophic forgetting. This means that all tasks have to be present in expectation for learning to progress. If we think about a data set that's relatively uniform, this makes sense. When we start to think about more complex data sets, broader data sets, multitask data sets, in an n-way tug of war, then you've got a lot of different gradients that you're computing. In the end, that parameter only changes in one direction. That's how we get to a stable solution for over both over two tasks. Um, even in a, in, a, in, in a multi in a in a stationary learning setting. So you'll say, but maybe this is really efficient for stationary learning, right? I'm move, I'm changing each per parameter in just one direction in a tug of war, but maybe all parts of the data set are learned at the same speed at the same time. So even though you're sort of splitting the decisions into all these little uh, little tugs of war, it doesn't really matter. We're going to, it's going to be efficient overall. But this isn't actually what happens. What happens is that most examples in a data set are learned fast. And then multiple repetitions are needed to learn the, all the remaining samples. The tail end of samples that are harder or classes that are that are harder will take a long time. However, all samples have to be present in expectation. So we keep on sampling over all of the data, even the easier ones. And this is a waste of computational resources. Um, so we see this happening um, in, in ImageNet. Um, we train over all of the thousand classes. Some of those classes are learned very quickly, but we keep on drawing samples across all of them. Um, we can also look at the discovery of concepts in data in learning environments and reinforcement learning environments. And we can also see that the concepts are discovered sequentially over time, even if they're simultaneous, even if support for them is simultaneously present in the data. So even if tasks are equally complex and presented simultaneously, in a fixed stationary IAD data set, then the model might still be learning them sequentially, thus losing a huge amount of efficiency due to this underlying tug of war dynamics. If continual learning can come up with alternate ways to train the same models, 
so that we can step through the data set and attend to only part of it at a time and learn more efficiently, then this could be a huge, huge win, even in stationary learning settings. This would potentially allow the same large scale deep learning models that we know and love to learn a little bit more like humans do. For instance, on ImageNet, starting with some classes, moving on to other classes, studying mushrooms for a while and then learning to identify dog breeds and then learning to identify uh, vehicles. This could be a very new way of looking at training uh, deep learning models. All right, I have belabored the point enough. Um, I think that this is uh, an, an um, exciting sort of way to think about continual learning, but I will let you be the judge. Um, all right, I will move on to talk about the different areas of uh, approaches that have been presented. Mainly these are approaches that have been presented in the last few years when continual learning has really uh, sort of become a more significant field primarily because of the um, increase in application areas for deep learning and also because of reinforcement learning, which is inherently non-stationary. Um, so if we look for solutions, then um, we can say, well, we're looking to stabilize these learning dynamics over a sequence of tasks without actually having the previous tasks uh, available. Um, and interestingly, I will note that I won't go into this, but from a neuroscience point of view, there's been an, a, lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of collaboration and uh, sort of inspiration that's come from neuroscience for a lot of these continual learning approaches. And I think that that's just an indication of the fact that we are moving towards a more human um, way of, of learning for these models, ideally. And so neuroscience is our best um, uh, best example. So here are the four solution spaces that I will talk about uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, first of all, gradient-based approaches. So directly manage that tug of war by trying to change the gradients, align them, or use uh, nuanced regularization. Um, modular approaches. So use architecture design or sparsity to allow for some task parameters to become specialized without impacting others. Um, memory approaches, an obvious approach here that we would want to use. We need to use memory, but in a scalable way um, to create proxy samples of previous tasks. Note that this does not help with the inefficiency of tug of war gradient based learning, but it does, uh, um, it, it's simply a way of, of handling this, this limitation by having proxies of previous tasks, remembering exemplars or encodings, for instance. Um, and lastly, meta-learning. So instead of designing our continual learning solution, let's learn that solution from data. Let's learn the inductive bias from data. All right, so first of all, gradient-based solutions. Like I said, the idea here is to fix the problem at the source. I have another little illustration here um, that shows um, here would be a network that's being trained over time for task one, task two, and task three being yellow. And what we want to do um, intuitively in a lot of these approaches is to somehow identify just the parts of the model that need to be protected. Like what are the parameters that need to be protected because they're important for task one? and try to reduce the plasticity for those parameters while leaving the plasticity high for other parameters so that there's still capacity. So that ideally we end up in a case where we've protected some important sort of core knowledge for different tasks, but we're allowing other things to become shared. So we want to encourage shared features because that's going to be the most efficient use of our capacity and also allow for forward transfer to happen if we are reusing parameters and reusing shared, um, shared, shared information. Um, all right, so a few different approaches here that I wanted to mention. Um, 
One method is a gradient episodic memory. The idea here is that we are going to align new gradients with old tasks. So we're going to force, we're going to clip or adjust some of the uh, new gradients that we see to align with the old tasks. Um, directly go in there and, 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 and tinker with what's going on um, in an algorithmic way, of course. Um, the second one would be to use regularization to change plasticity of some parameters. The hard part is identifying, deciding how do you identify which parameters are most important and how do you regular, regularize them and how much do you regularize them? Um, so that's sort of a, a bit the, the hard part of that approach. Um, and that's work that we did at DeepMind called Elastic Weight Consolidation, um, which is directly inspired from what we know about plasticity in the brain. Uh, synaptic consolidation in the brain. Um, a related approach is called synaptic intelligence. Um, and, and, and lastly, one can use, uh, this is sort of related to gradient-based solutions, but using distillation to mitigate parameter drift by uh, applying, a, um, applying a, a KL term to keep the actual representations from changing too much as you go from task to task without maintaining old data. So using um, gaining stability from the sort of soft activations um, um, in the neural network uh, on new data, but after training on previous tasks. So that's learning the learning without forgetting method really made a very interesting uh, approach based on that, that idea. I'm not giving, by the way, there's been lots of publications in the last few years and I'm not going to give uh, all of them. Um, that would be hard to do. So my apologies, my apologies if I uh, do not mention one of your one of your favorite papers. Um, so the second, that's all I have to say in gradient based solutions, but I will mention that I think that there's a lot more work to be done here. I think that um, um, understanding what's going on in the, in, from this tug of war point of view and changing those learning dynamics. Um, might be the most um, the most effective thing, the most power, the most general approach we could take, but very difficult to start, like I said, tinkering around with um, with the with the optimization. Um, all right, the second area of approaches um, that we've developed at DeepMind and my team and that have also been worked on in the larger community involves modularity and sparsity, which don't seem immediately like they should be related, but they are. It's a way of taking a, a single architecture and identifying um, a partitioning, whether a soft partitioning or a hard partitioning that separates the effect of some parameters on others. Um, so I think that this offers a modularity, gives us a way to perhaps have a middle ground um, between having a monolithic architecture, which is um, going to be uh, um, more um, liable to, to have catastrophic forgetting problems, and an ensemble where we've broken up that model into pieces. There's not going to be any interference there, but there's also not going to be any sharing. There's not going to be any uh, forward transfer or shared representations, which is a fundamental aspect of deep learning models. Um, so um, one type of approach here is to add on capacity for new tasks. Um, this has definitely some um, limitations to it, this general approach. So first of all, you usually need to know what the task boundaries are in order to do well on this. Um, and we don't always have those task boundaries. Those task boundaries don't always exist, um, or we may not want to have that privileged information as to when they occur. Um, there's also a problem here with capacity. So how do you manage the capacity if you're going to keep on adding on new capacity? How do you manage the overall capacity if you keep on adding parameters for new tasks? Um, so there needs to be a way to manage this. And the second set of approaches that I've listed here use either compression or pruning to scale that further. So for instance, we've got progressive neural networks um, uh, and dynamically expandable networks. These are both ways of increasing the, the scale. There's neurogenesis deep learning and reinforced continual learning. I won't go into 
Um, uh, th these are all actually quite different approaches and quite interesting in how they decide where and how to increase uh, capacity. Um, the second set of approaches, progress and compress and continual learning via neural pruning, they both uh, have the, uh, a, a similar uh, approach, one using pruning, one compression, where we're going to expand capacity and then we're going to uh, um, compress it back. So this is a uh, figure of the architecture and the learning process from the progress and compress paper, which is from Jonathan Schwartz um, and others, including myself at DeepMind. So in the um, um, compress phase, then we do a distillation. And in the progress phase, we're going to add capacity and learn a new task. So I think about this as a little bit like a wake sleep algorithm. When I'm awake, I learn a new task. I add new capacity in order to very quickly learn that task. Um, but I draw on things that I've previously learned, right? So I'm drawing on my episodic memory and my knowledge of previous tasks um, to do better on that new task. Um, and then when I go to sleep, I'm going to consolidate. I'm going to compress that, um, that new knowledge that I've gained back into um, back into my, my knowledge base, back into my memory. Um, and this is a process that is scalable. There is never a permanent in increase in capacity. Uh, so theoretically, this could go on uh, for an infinite set of tasks, uh, although perhaps the, there would at some point start to be forgetting because we can't have infinite capacity in that base neural network. Um, let's see, and I, an, another couple of examples. Um, so, well, another way of thinking about modularity could be that we begin with a nice large network and we partition it by channeling task gradients just to unused parts of it. So I've got this big blank slate, my millions, billions of parameters in my neural network. I'm going to um, decide how to, what part of that to use when, as I train over time. Um, for instance, if my gradients are too much, causing too much uh, interference with part of the network that's already been trained, then that would be a cue for the algorithm to say, well, I'm not gonna disturb that because it's pushing all the gradients, this or pushing all the parameters this way. I want to push them all that way. So instead I'm gonna find a different path through the network, find unused territory um, to, to write my features into, um, to change the parameters. And so that's sort of the basic intuition between a, a few different uh, approaches that have worked very well, actually. So PathNet did this through um, um, evolutionary search, actually, for different paths. And that's what's depicted here is different modules being shared, reused, different paths being found for different uh, Atari games. In PathNet from Crisanta Fernando, um, there's an approach on overcoming catastrophic forgetting using conceptors um, from he, where we look at the look for the um, um, uh, projection of the, the null space of the parameters to look for new areas to write uh, to write to. Uh, random path selection. This is a longer title, I've forgotten. Uh, what it is, um, um, but has relationship to, to PathNet. And then in uh, one last sort of area of modularity and sparsity, we've got, um, we've got sparsity. So if we enforce the sparsity of network, either the sparsity of the activations, um, uh, so the sp a sparse representation, or the sparsity of the gradients, then that will already limit the extent and the impact of learning updates. If I can only affect 100 parameters of a, uh, of, of, of a neural network with my learning update, then there's only so much damage I can do. So if we combine sparsity uh, constraints with other types of approaches, there could be some quite powerful methods there um, that would uh, handle the um, um, this sort of goes back to the tug of war dynamics. 
and said, let's see how few parameters I can use in this, uh, in this tug of war, how few different samples I can use while still having stable learning. Um, all right, uh, let me go on. So the third area of solutions is in uh, memory-based solutions for continual learning. And um, this is, um, again, I think it's quite intuitive. This is how we handle catastrophic, uh, our own problems with forgetting. We use memory. Um, we use short-term memory, we use long-term memory, we use episodic memory. Um, neuroscientists have a lot, have done a lot of work in studying different types of, of memory um, within the brain. And so intuitively this makes sense. However, this is very hard to actually make it work um, for uh, continual learning. Um, so let's just go through some of the different ways in which we could use memory. Um, so at the beginning here, simple but effective. Just save the data, save the experience, to save a buffer of past experience. Um, or episodic memory is sort of a one-up on basic replay by saying, I'm also going to do inference on that past experience. Um, and uh, this works, but it works, but you've got a problem there with how much can you remember? Can we really just replay is just put everything I've seen into a buffer um, and then, you know, have some limit on the size of that and dump it at the end when, um, when, when the buffer overflows. Um, the, the, this, this isn't a solution that really scales to AGI type of um, problem level, right? Works well for a sequence of five Atari games, doesn't work well for 50 Atari games, and doesn't work well for sort of real world um, applications. Um, so, so that being said, it's an interesting area. What are the right things to, uh, to, to store, how to manage this, how to sample it, how to prioritize um, the sampling of, of, of replay, et cetera. Um, so there's been quite a bit of work here uh, for these different different types of, of approaches that rely on replay or episodic memory. Um, and I've shown one here, which is MBPA, which is memory-based parameter adapt adaptation. Um, and so here we're going to store, we're going to use a parametric network to encode the data, encode the experience and store that in memory. So you're getting a lot of compression and savings there. Um, and then you uh, use that in order to query, you query your episodic memory, retrieve some content and then train quickly on that. So you're doing specialized training when you see something that you recognize from previous experience. Um, more scalable, perhaps, if we decide to use only exemplars, so not store everything, not even store most uh, data, but only store a select uh, small amount of information or memory vectors. Um, uh, so this is a highly sparse memory setting. And here, of course, the challenge is deciding which things to remember. When I look out at the world, what do I, what do I remember? Um, so iCarl is a really nice high-performing approach there um, and using hindsight to anchor, uh, anchor memory for continual learning, I think is the title, the full title of that. And then we could go in a even more biologically plausible direction and say, well, um, you know, humans and animals do not have a memory system that records things perfectly. We don't have a storage system it's, that uh, allows us to do perfect recall um, from our representations. We certainly aren't remembering actual pixels of things that we've seen, um, and nor are we perfectly recalling even uh, memory vectors that we you know, saw a year ago. Rather, we rely presumably on uh, generative models internally. Uh, so the idea here is to rather than, re, than rather than store any hard fixed data, we're going to uh, use general generative models to replace those, and then we can use the generative model to give us data for a particular task, so that we can 
uh, retrain on it and keep it fresh, keep it, um, um, remember how to, uh, how to solve a given task by using a generator of that task um, in perpetuity. Um, so a couple of, of approaches here, deep generative replay, I think was the first to do this for continual learning and then continual unsupervised representation learning or curl does this in an unsupervised um, setting. All right, and the last area is meta learning. Um, so perhaps rather all of these previous examples I've given relied on one of us, a research scientist, a PhD student, a professor somewhere coming up with an idea. What is the architecture? What is the loss function? What is the update rule? Um, um, how is this going to work in order to get to continual, a continual learning solution? Rather than hand engineering that, let's take a step back and use learning in order to learn continual learning. That was one too many learns. Um, so the basic idea of meta-learning is that there's an inner loop that optimizes for a specific task. That could be a specific data sample, a specific trajectory, a specific uh, class, um, a discrimination problem, uh, even an, an RL problem or a game, right? So the inner loop is going to optimize learn as we usually do for a specific task. And then there will also be an outer loop that's going to optimize over a set of these tasks, a number of them. And it will either optimize for performance overall um, or speed of learning. And how these inner loop and the outer loop work, um, how they do that optimization and what exactly the objective is that they are optimizing, this is what differentiates different uh, meta-learning approaches that are out there. So in particular, we could think about meta-learning as being an approach for continual learning if the outer loop is optimizing over not just a set of tasks, but a sequence of tasks. Um, so for continual learning, the outer loop would optimize for performance or knowledge retention in non-stationary settings. And there's just been a small amount of work done on this um, but I hope that there will be more. Um, so Warped Gradient Descent is a work that gave a uh, new approach for meta-learning and also has, it's a bit buried in an appendix, but has an, an approach, um, has a set of experiments that push towards learning to continually learn um, by showing that if the, the outer loop optimizes for knowledge retention over a sequence of tasks, um, then um, then the procedure can learn the right inductive biases. Um, there's deep online learning via meta-learning and there's learning to continue, continually learn. And I've forgotten one of the most important ones, which is um, online aware meta-learning um, from uh, Martha White um, and others. I'm sorry for leaving that off. Uh, I will note that when we think about meta-learning as the solution to all of life's problems, uh, there's no free lunch. So meta-learning requires really careful designing of the actual task distribution. In some ways, it pushes the design aspect of it from designing the architecture, the loss function, and the update rule to designing the tasks, the data, the environment. Um, and it can be just as difficult to do that, I think, as, as design the model. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a challenge. And also these approaches are very computationally demanding uh, because of this outer loop, inner loop sort of formulation um, and the inherent sort of inefficiency of, uh, of, of learning um, in the settings to begin with. Um, all right. So that is the end of my talk on continual learning. Um, I just wanted to summarize and say that um, I really think that continual learning is important on a lot of levels. Um, for deployed applications, definitely. Um, I am afraid for the next time I see a news report about an online adaptable algorithm that's been set out into the wild and has 
gone in the wrong direction, has you know evolved to um, you know to 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 make mistakes and answer the wrong question. This is why there there aren't any online learning algorithms, um, continual learning algorithms on, for instance, self-driving cars. And there shouldn't be until we solve some of the fundamental problems. We don't know how to adapt things in a stable way, in a safe way, um, in important application areas like self-driving cars and health. Um, but it is important if we really want to solve some of these real world problems. Um, it's also important for human level AGI, which is the mission of DeepMind. Um, and I think it's also, as I, as I tried to argue, I think it could be a, a result in a massive change in how we train deep learning models, even in stationary environments. Um, and this comes from the fact that I think one of the overlooked challenges is in uh, understanding the learning dynamics of gradient-based optimization and coming up with different approaches um, and different solutions here. Um, and there are a lot of different research directions. And of course, um, it's not quite so clearly differentiated as how I uh, laid it out. A lot of those methods that I mentioned are actually crossovers between different areas um, and involve bringing together uh, sparsity and memory and meta-learning and uh, you know, gradient optimization. So uh, there are, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of different um, directions we could go and a lot of interesting um, approaches yet to be found. All right, thank you very much.